recording. Good timing, Ali. Um, and uh, I'll just say once again, if you want to uh, just keep yourself on mute, it seems like that's what most people are doing already. That would be great for background noise. We do encourage your participation later on when we uh, are having our panel conversation. We will be um, uh, welcoming your questions during that time and looking forward to, to, to that. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll be sharing screen for a little bit of this presentation and then we'll come back off when we get to the panel conversation. I'm sure others will be will be coming in so. Can everyone see that someone gives me give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So thank you again um, for. Uh, deciding to spend some time with us during this lunch and learn. This is our food advocacy 101 session and um, we are so pleased to have you here with us. First, I want to share a little bit about the Food Policy Council itself. The Food Policy Council has been around for more than 10 years. We have 25 council members who serve terms of anywhere between one and four years and the purpose of the Council is to create a more just and resilient food system in Rhode Island. The Council is um, very aware of the many serious issues that are posed by um, different aspects of the food system and Council members are committed to uh, working on those issues wherever they exist, um, specifically using lenses related to climate change and, um, and equity and working to center those issues in everything that we do. Um, the Council works using a participatory collaborative decision making process. So everyone on the Council is a leader and we really work hard to create spaces where everybody is allowed to participate um, and feels comfortable participating in that way. So um, the Council's vision is one where there's increasing production of and demand for local food, a thriving and just food economy, access to affordable, healthful, culturally relevant food for all residents, community health for all residents and a sustainable environment. Our mission is to promote an equitable, accessible, economically vibrant and environmentally sustainable food system for all Rhode Islanders. And what we're going to do today is talk about why food policy is important, how laws are made in Rhode Island, why you should advocate and how, and then we're going to introduce you to the food policy priorities of the Rhode Island Food Policy Council members for this current legislative year. And then we'll move on to our panel discussion. So as you all know, the food system is complex and there can be problems in all of the different parts of the food system. Uh, making changes in one part can and, and usually will have consequences for um, other parts as well. So the Food Policy Council thinks about all of the different aspects in what you might call the food marketing chain. That's the inner circle there that includes farms and fisheries production, processing, distribution, retail, consumption, including access of, for, of course, and also the management of food waste. And we also think about those pieces that are outside of the circle. So healthy soil, clean air, capital access, supportive policy environment. And, and as we get started, I just want to share a little bit about the food system in Rhode Island, just to highlight why it's important to everyone, whether your top interest is the economy, community health and well being um, or the environment. So the food sector economic output is over $11 billion in Rhode Island. The sector supports over 75,000 jobs. We have 55,000 acres in farmland that's being farmed by over a thousand different farmers. We also have a considerable uh, seafood and aquaculture industry with over 100 million in, um, in value every year. And at the same time, we deal with many challenges related to food access. The Rhode Island Community Food Bank estimates that one in six households are struggling with hunger. The data that we use comes from a lot of different sources, but primarily it comes from um, national level data sets by the, like the US Census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We also do our own internal research, internal meaning of the network itself. So we put out a survey every year, and this past year our survey had over 500 responses, 
One of the questions we asked was about high priority activities for improving Rhode Island's food system by 2030. And uh, you can see here the top five issues that were selected by the, the people who responded. Preserving and protecting agricultural land, reducing inequity in the food system, supporting small food businesses by providing capital and technical assistance, ensuring access to affordable, culturally appropriate food for all people, and promoting climate smart practices. So that's what I wanted to provide by way of an introduction. And now I'm going to hand it over to our council member, Steve Arthurs, who leads our policy committee to talk a bit about how, uh, how laws are made in Rhode Island and why advocacy is important. Thank you, Nessa. Um, as you look at this slide, you can see we've kind of outlined in this diagram a 10 step process of how a bill can get passed. Um, unfortunately, each one of these steps has, depending on the bill, one, two, or three sub steps. So there's actually like a 30 step process um, of how a bill gets passed, which is one reason why many bills take many sessions before they actually um, move forward. But it also provides a good opportunity um, for us in this process to either advocate or lobby for or against a certain bill or support legislators um, to submit legislations on our behalf for issues that are important to us. Um, so the first one, obviously the, the, the bill's created. So a legislator will submit bills either on behalf of his constituents, um, they represent a cause that, they're, uh, that they champion, um, a bill from an organization they support, or oftentimes it's a bill that they've submitted previously that's kind of in the cycle of trying to move it forward. Um, so they would modify it from what uh, they did in the past, try and get additional supporters to you know, co-sign the bill and move it along. Um, when the bill is introduced, it is uh, assigned a bill number and assigned to a committee. So in the example I'll use here, if if the, we'll just assume there's gonna be a bill that originates in the house that was assigned to house finance. Um, so when the bill's introduced, the sponsor tries to do several things, but he tries to get support among the committee members, obviously, so he can get a hearing, he or she can get a hearing. Um, if, the bill, if the bill is heard, um, you know, the challenges for the uh, sponsor to say why he sponsored the bill, and then you hear testimony uh, both for and against the bill. Um, then as a result of that, and oftentimes on the first go around, particularly if it's early in the session, the bill is held for further study. Um, oftentimes though, other bills are introduced and never get a hearing, so they could basically sit there for the entire session. Um, but oftentimes they'll get a hearing, particularly the last two years, um, on the House side, they would basically let any legislator that submits a bill that wants a hearing get a hearing. Um, so the bill is introduced, you have the hearing, it can be held um, and not had a hearing. If they submit and have a hearing, the sponsor presents why he's doing the bill, you hear testimony, then the bill can either be held, passed, and it's seldom uh, outright rejected. And then during that interim process, uh, while the bill is being held, the sponsor can, um, you know, he's, he's out trying to get more, more knowledge on the bill. He'll kind of address the issues that came up on those that were against the bill. And he'll try and gain more support among um, leadership and among other members of the committee. If it's granted another hearing, often called a consideration hearing, um, we'll go through the, it will go through the same process again. If the bill passes out of committee, um, it then has to go to a floor vote. So in our example, the bill went, it was a house bill and went before house finance, house finance passed the bill. Uh, the bill would go to the floor uh, for a vote up or down. Um, when it reaches the legislative floor, they obviously uh, take a vote and they can either pass it, uh, reject it, which doesn't often happen, or they can, um, you know, they can do a floor amendment and pass that as well. So those are the options. Once it passes, assuming it does pass out of committee or, and then passes out of the floor, the next step it was, it's gonna be sent to the other body, which in our example would be the Senate. 
and it's going to go through this whole process again. It'll be assigned to a committee on the Senate side. Uh, they may or may not hear it. We saw a number of bills uh, last year that passed the Senate early in the session, went over to the House and basically just stayed there, didn't even get a hearing. So there's still room there for, um, for advocacy and lobbying on behalf of the bill or against the bill if you're against it, because just to get the... Uh, just to get it heard again is another vital step in the process. And the same thing can happen when it's in that committee. It could be heard, it could be held for further study, or it could be passed out of committee. Um, if it's passed out of committee, it then needs to go to the, um, the floor for a floor vote in, that, in, the, in the opposite uh, house body. And our example would be go to the Senate. So the Senate, uh, and it's normally heard within one to two weeks after it comes out of that committee. When it goes to the Senate, they could hear it and hold it. They could hear it and uh, pass it. And then, you, so it's, if it's passed without amendments, it could then go to the governor. If in fact, they did a floor amendment or made changes to it, then it would go back over to the other house and start the process all over again. When it goes to the governor, he can either, um, you know, he can either sign the bill into law, or he can let it pass without signing, which basically he would do nothing, he or she would do nothing, or, um, you know, he could reject the bill. If he rejects the bill, it can go back and be overridden, which it oftentimes is in Rhode Island. Uh, keep in mind, Rhode Island does not have the, uh, doesn't give the governor the authority or the power to do a line item veto. So when he gets a, a bill or a law, he can either approve it, reject it, or let it pass without um, uh, without doing anything. Um, that, that's really his vote of uh, opposition to the bill. So throughout the process, you can see there's just ample opportunity for input because um, legislators, you know, want input, um, and you have the opportunity both to advocate, or in this case, when the law is moving along, you're actually lobbying. Um, so. It's obviously a very long and tedious process. Um, we have to keep in mind laws and regulations can also be made within the budget and not, and not go through this particular process. Um, but throughout the process, just note that there's opportunities for advocacy and lobbying. Um, and that's what we'll spend, if we can go to the next slide, we'll just um, touch on that for, for a bit. So advocacy, it's defined as public support for a recommendation of a particular cause or policy. Very simple and straightforward. Why does one advocate? Um, public policy can play a powerful positive role in making the world better or a better place, but can also be destructive. So many bills are submitted, put together and submitted and you read them on face value on the top part of the bill and you say, well, that's a good cause. We should probably do something. But the reality is there's other pieces of the bill or the detail of the bill that aren't advantageous to certain groups or for all the good the bill is gonna do, here's the issues involved with the bill. So when you advocate or, or lobby against for, let's do advocacy, advocacy now. When you're advocating for a bill, you really want the, uh, the legislator that's uh, passing the bill or, or you want to introduce a bill um, to understand why, um, you know, why it's important. What are the good points of the bill? If it's good bills can have a negative impact. So if we can go to the next slide. So while lobbying is advocacy, not all advocacy is lobbying. Here's the lobbying, here's the difference. Advocacy is any action that speaks in favor or recommends, argues for a cause, supports or defends or pleads on behalf of others. It can include public education, regulatory work, litigation, work before the administrative bodies, lobbying, um, nonpartisan voter registration, not partisan voter education and more. Examples of, uh, of advocacy on the next slide would be, um, you know, and it, it applies to all levels of government. So you can ask your community zoning board for permission to have a farmer's market in an um, in unserved neighborhood. You can request a parking variance to allow for a meal truck to serve people without housing in a park. 
You can arrange a meeting with an elected official and then educate them about the value of job training for food business that uses public funding. Oh Lord, we can convening with community leaders in an emergency to develop solutions for community memberships uh, needs. So why is lobbying different from advocacy? Lobbying is communicating with decision makers directly. There can be elected officials and staff voters on ballot issues, but you, you uh, communicate with them about existing or potential legislation and urging them to vote for and against it. So all three of those components um, are part of lobbying. Decision make, has to be a decision maker that, that you're approaching. It's actual legislation, either submitted, proposed, or pending legislation, and you're asking for a vote one way or the other. So how much lobbying can a nonprofit do? Nonprofits can lobby. The key is to make sure that they remain to the level that is acceptable to the IRS. So what's acceptable? If we go to the next slide. As an example, in an election year, which is this year, you can advocate for an issue, you can sponsor a candidate's appearance, you can sponsor a candidate's debate, you can invite elected officials to an event, you can try and persuade an elected official to agree with you on your issue and then take a public stand. You can work to get your issues on a political party's platform. And then you can work on getting out in the vote as long as it's in a nonpartisan non way. What you can't do is contribute cash in any kind of support to a campaign, support a specific candidate or endorse a candidate. So this whole process isn't easy. Influencing public policy change can be very difficult and complex, particularly those with limited power and resources, but we can do it and it's important to do it. Um, so you can inform and activate your network. You can research the impact of policy issues, educate policymakers and the public. You know, legislators, once again, don't have time to fully understand all of the issues. They welcome the education part of it. And then you can join forces to create a louder voice. That's really forming a coalition. When groups of like-minded people get together, if you increase your numbers and join with other uh, organizations or committees, you have a much louder voice and can be heard. So we covered quite a bit and saw how laborious it can be to get a law passed and why it's important to understand and to advocate and to lobby. We'll now turn it back to Nessa, who's gonna review the 2023 Rhode Island Food Policy Council legislative priorities. Thank you so much, Steve. Um... I'm gonna go ahead and share with you the council's policy priorities for this session. Um, we want to do this just uh, to share with you the, you know, the input that we received, that we received from the, um, the survey, all of the conversations that our work group members and council members have been having, and to give you a sense of where that's ended up. Um, these are the four areas where the council members and wider network have seen the biggest challenges and opportunities and really see a role for public policy to uh, make the system work better. So, as I noted, we have work groups that focus on understanding policy actions um, that can impact our climate on food access, food waste, our food economy. And I want to make a special note that these work groups aren't just open to council members, they're open to everyone. And uh, there have been over 100 people actively participating in our work groups over the past year. We will have information about how to join work groups and use the bill tracker um, that we have on our website and get involved in other ways um, at the end of, well, after the panel speaks. So these are the four areas that the council work group and work groups have been focusing on. First, preserving our farms. We're supporting land access for farming across Rhode Island by ensuring consistent adequate funding for the Agricultural Land Preservation Commission, increased and sustained funding for the Farmland Access Program, and by creating an, and funding a new urban farmland access program. Second, we're working on developing a comprehensive strategy for minimizing and diverting wasted food going into the landfill, which includes both tax incentives for excess food donation as well as wider mandates and increased support for residential and commercial organic waste composting. 
Third, we're supporting new sustainable avenues for local farmers, seafood harvesters, and other businesses, businesses to easily sell and deliver nutritious food um, to both direct and indirect markets that serve food insecure communities and residents. And finally, um, in the business sector, we're supporting second stage food businesses with shared use infrastructure, marketing and technical assistance, grants, tax incentives, and low cost loans. Uh, so supporting policies that provide all of those things and that set a percentage of those programs to go to historically underserved business owners. And um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask our um, board president, Diane Lynch, to introduce our panel. Thanks, Nessa. We have three really great panelists today. Each one of them has really deep experience and expertise in introducing, supporting, and passing legislation that's important to our food system and to Rhode Island. I'm gonna introduce them briefly and let them speak about their work. While they're talking, if you have questions for them, just put them in the chat. We are gonna have plenty of time afterwards for a Q&A. So uh, don't be shy, uh, they're willing to answer any questions. The first is Kerry Connolly. Uh, Kerry is the de Deputy Director at the Rhode Island Public Health Institute. And um, the Health Institute and Kerry were instrumental in passing some really important legislation last year that will support fruit and vegetable incentives for SNAP beneficiaries and grocery stores. I'm gonna start with Kerry, but before I do, I'd just also like to introduce Priscilla de la Cruz. Priscilla is Senior Director of Government Affairs at the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. She's also serving as the President of the Environment Council of Rhode Island. And Priscilla has been involved in many legislative campaigns, most notably the Act on uh, Climate 2021 and last year's big win on renewable energy. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Ryan Mulcahy. And Ryan is the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. <clears throat> and he has been involved in many different legislative issues uh, uh, around our food system and natural resources. So without further ado, um, let's start with uh, Carrie. And Carrie, could you start off by telling us a little bit about your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you, Diane. Thank you to the Policy Council for having me. Um, I've been um, with the Rhode Island Public Health Institute for almost four years now, um, previously serving as the food access manager and now the <clears throat> deputy director for the organization. Um, our organization's mission is to um, reduce uh, health disparities in Rhode Island and beyond. And we kind of have two divisions of work, our infectious disease side and our chronic disease side. And the way we look at chronic disease is through um, food access and food security and food nutrition. Um, and so in the last <clears throat> three years, I've been leading a, excuse me, my allergies are a little bad today. So my voice is a little off. Um, so the last three years, I've been leading a um, coalition called the Nourisher Island Coalition, um, along with um, our executive director, Dr. Nunn, um, and we have been advocating for a statewide retail SNAP incentive program um, that would give all SNAP recipients in the state of Rhode Island a 50% discount on their fresh fruit and vegetable purchases at the retail grocery store. Um, and we kind of developed the evidence base from that of that from our Food on the Move program, um, which is a, a small direct service research program of the Public Health Institute, um, which is a year-round mobile produce market um, where we also offer that 50% SNAP incentive discount. So Diane, do you want me to get into the policy work now or do we want to save that for a little bit? <laughs> um, there's a lot you could get into. Yeah. <laughs> you could probably speak for an hour about the policy work. Um, <laughs> Maybe um, it would be interesting for you to just highlight for a minute or two, you know, how that process unfolded over three years, because I yeah. believe it was a three year process. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Um, so I think the first step and in, in something that's kind of crucial to all advocacy, I think, is that. Um, we decided to advocate for something the, the community told us that they wanted. It wasn't kind of a, a, a something that we decided was important to us. Um, and so the first step was to kind of design the program that we wanted to advocate for. And so to do that, we convened um, a committee, uh, like a planning committee to design the program. Um, 
Steve from the Food Dealer Association was there, Food Policy Council members, DOH, DHS, um, really all major organizations um, in the state. Um, we also wanted to make sure SNAP recipients had a voice in this program. So we administered about 150 surveys with SNAP recipients and we did two focus groups with SNAP recipients. And that really informed our program design. Um, one aspect where that's clear, for example, is <clears throat> um, the um, discount that we offered. We kind of went into it thinking that SNAP recipients would want it on canned, frozen, and fresh um, produce. But what they told us was that they were already eating um, the canned and the frozen produce because it was already in their price range. And what they would really prefer access to is um, fresh produce, which is much more expensive. Um, we saw this particularly in um, first generation immigrants who came from countries of origin where they had community gardens or, you know, fruits and vegetables in their backyard. Um, so that was, that was definitely an interesting program decision that we made based on that information. Um, so that was kind of year one of once we had the program design, our original plan was to ask for a state appropriation. Um, and then of course COVID happened. Um, so that was no longer something that, that was on the table. Obviously those resources had to be directed to, to, um, to meet that crisis. Um, and so we kind of took a step back and we said, okay, well, how can we get funding for this program? And so we had commissioned an economics modeling firm to do a projection of what this would cost. And they estimated about $25 million a year, which is no small price tag. Um, and so we said, all right, well, what, what other ways can we fund this? And as the Rhode Island Public Institute, Health Institute, we have previously been supportive of, of the sugary drinks tax in the past. Um, and um, just for as a public health organization. And so a American Heart Association had previously led that advocacy. And so we, you know, call, we got together with them. And we said, how can we combine these things um, to make this really a, a more fruitful bill for everybody? Um, and so in January, 2021, we rewrote the bill. We got our sponsors, as kind of Steve walked you through, we got our sponsors, we got our co-sponsors and we um, launched a, an advocacy paint campaign that session. Um, we also um, wrote grants for advocacy dollars um, because it is crucial to note that you can't, like we're a nonprofit, so we have a lot of federal grants and we can never use federal dollars to lobby. So we had to get private lobby dollars to do that. Um, and so lobbying is incredibly expensive. And I think that that creates a huge barrier, um, unfortunately, to get some of these policies passed. Um, but it was a really successful campaign. We had 55 earned media articles. We had 16 co-sponsors in the House and Senate. Um, and I think what ultimately worked against us is the federal dollars that came in um, that session at the end of the session through the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, Rhode Island got $1.19 in funding and that made a tax really unappealing at that point in time. Um, so at the end of that session, we took another step back and we said, okay, let's let how are we going to advocate for it again this session? Um, and so what we did is we asked for a budget appropriation from the ARPA dollars. Um, to fund the, the program statewide. Um, and we, now we did not get the full ask, but we did get $11.5 million. Uh, it's going straight to the Department of Human Services. And the program is set to go live in the spring. Um, and we're so excited. <laughs> so that's three years in a nutshell. <laughs> thank you. That, that wasn't easy to do. Um, but anyway, thank you. That was very instructive. Um, we're gonna move next to Priscilla. Priscilla, tell us a little bit about your work and, and how your advocacy work has gone over the last few years. Sure, I will try to be as descriptive and concise at the same time as Carrie. That, that was quite an accomplishment there. Um, so as, as you heard, uh, I work for the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. Um, prior to joining the team, um, Audubon adopted a new strategic plan um, June of 2020. Um, so really um, reinforcing our mission at Audubon as an independent Audubon. We have 17,000 members and supporters and what unifies us is our mission, which is to protect birds, wildlife, their habitat um, for the benefit of all living things and for people. So really ensuring that the people along with wildlife are at the center of the work that we do through advocacy, which is my wheelhouse, but we also do con conservation work. Um, Audubon um, preserves and owns about 10,000 um, acres of land that are preserved for wildlife um, habitat and for the access of people, which became very critical during the pandemic. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to really walk the walk and practice climate resiliency. 
um, and best practices that we want to share with other landowners and the state, um, the state's forestry, forestry division as well. Um, we also have education programs. Our educators touch about 20,000 students. They reach 20,000 students a year. Um, and what's really neat about the strategic plan that we adopted back in 2020 is that it centers the climate crisis. It really unifies all of the work that we're doing from department to department um, when we're looking at advocacy, when we're looking at conservation, when we're looking at education. And it really elevates the issue of education and engagement of the climate of, of the public on climate issues. Um, and it, I, for me, um, I was actually um, interviewed yesterday um, by a reporter and, and they were asking me, you know, how do you set your policy priorities? And, and there's just so much out there in the climate and environmental space. And I said, you know, with my role at Audubon, my framework is really our strategic plan. And that strategic plan is based on science, you know, what the latest science is telling us that we need to do. Um, in Rhode Island to do our part to respond to the climate crisis. Um, so that's really guiding our policy vision. And that led Audubon um, to form a multi-year effort, as I mentioned, with the Act on Climate. Um, so that was really nice and fulfilling for me to be able to bring the coalition work that I was doing um, when I was at Green Energy Consumers Alliance for about 12 years. Um, I had already been doing work with the Environment Council of Rhode Island on coalition building around the climate crisis campaign. So really calling for statewide action um, to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to do that in a way that was just and equitable. Um, so Audubon played a key role in co-leading that coalition um, and we were successful I mean, it really involved a wide range of voices coming together saying we need to act on climate. Um, and, you know, the time was yesterday. We really have to get pragmatic about how we're going to reach targets, but how those targets are going to be enforced um, and how they're going to be mandatory. Um, so we continue to engage in that space. We see that as a priority when it comes to how that law will be implemented. Um, I continue to work with other advocates and members of the Environment Council um, to really follow the state's process, which has been um, pretty tremendous and transferable in terms of the number of listening sessions that have been held in different focus areas like land use and, you know, hearing about the building sector, what it would take to decarbonize transportation, and in the works right now is one around environmental justice. Um, and all this information has been posted online for the public to access, to comment, as the plan is being developed um, and what the state is currently doing now, which Ryan can speak more to is updating the 2016 greenhouse gas emissions plan um, and creating a 2022 update. And this is a very important framework for what the state will develop going forward every five years for a strategic plan on climate action. So I think from our end as advocates and in my role at Audubon, we're making sure that we're not only part of what it takes to create um, and pass legislation, but that we're also following very closely how legislation is implemented. Um, and then quickly, I will mention, um, Audubon also made a decision to join another coalition called Climate Jobs for Rhode Island. That is a partnership between labor and environmental groups um, coming together with the understanding that we might not agree on everything, uh, but what we do agree on is pretty vast when it comes to the climate crisis that we're facing and the jobs of today and tomorrow. Um, so ensuring that as we work to transition to a green economy, that again, that transition is just and equitable. So that has been tremendous when it, when it came to passing the Act on Climate, now in its implementation work, and also looking at other pieces of legislation that would codify the interim targets of the Act on Climate. For example, um, we have to reach 45% 40, carbon emission reductions by 2030. That's coming up pretty fast. Um, so this past legislative session, we were pleased that we were able to work together to get 100% renewable electricity by 2033 across the finish line and also in addition to procurement for offshore wind. Um, so that is just, at a high level, um, an aspect of how we approach our policy making and the decisions we made to join working groups or coalitions. Um, I will say going forward for Audubon, um, we wanna continue doing the work that we have been doing around pollinator protection 
and really educating legislators and the public about the harmful impacts of using pesticides. This past session, working with DEM, in particular, Ryan, thank you so much um, for really convening um, conservationists, um, environmentalists, and, and also landowners and the Farm Bureau to talk about how are we going to reduce or restrict harmful pesticides like neonics that are impacting pollinators, thus having a result on our ecosystem and our food supply chain. So we wanna continue doing that work. It's been a multi-year effort for us. Again, um, building coalition and working groups has been essential to disseminating information and to getting um, pieces of legislation across the finish line. Um, and last but not least, there's a lot to do around plastic waste. Um, so I was pleased to see um, in your slides um, coming from the Food Policy Council, how you are thinking about clean water and waste. I think that could be an area that we could work together on. Um, there's a lot more to do beyond you know, banning plastic bags um, or trying to reduce the number of plastic straws. Um, we really have to get serious about how we're going to reduce um, plastic pollution and look at things like um, the bottle bill, the um, end producer responsibility bills that other states are moving forward with. And of course, we had a, a recent victory with PFAS known as Forever Chemicals um, in drinking water and starting to regulate that and also in food packaging. But that is really right where we're we're at the surface of what really needs to be done to tackle pollution overall. So I will stop there because I could probably keep going for another hour or two. Thank you. Um, that was a lot, and that was really well consolidated. And I know that both of those areas, um, pesticides and plastic waste, are are very complex, and we might have a chance to talk about that going forward as well. So, but thank you. Ryan, um, I know that you haven't been spearheading a particular campaign as part of your work, but you've worked in, in, in so many different areas. It would be great to get perspective on, on the work that you do. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Um, yeah, so I, I can speak from a little bit of a different perspective, um, just coming from a, a state agency. Um, you know, obviously, I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is, you know, DM is part of a, a larger administration. Um, and so we have to work with a lot of different um, offices and in some cases, separate departments within state government to get things done. Um, the last couple of years have just been incredibly rewarding. Um, so just to take a step back, I've, I've been at DM since um, the beginning of 2019. Um, so I'm coming up on four years and, and I could just say that just in the last two legislative sessions, we've seen so many great bills move through the General Assembly and, and be signed into law. Um, it's It's been a, a fantastic couple of years and uh, Priscilla checked off a, quite a few of the, the bills that, that come to mind, um, whether it's PFAS or, or neonics or plastic bags. Um, the Act on Climate obviously was a huge success. Uh, but one piece that I'll, I'll just focus on a little bit is uh, the DEM budget. Um, so this past year, uh, we we had what is probably the best budget that DM has has received in at least 20 years. Um, many of you might know Terry Gray, uh, the director of DEM. He's been here for, uh, I think he's on about 35 years now, and, and he tells me it's the best budget that he's seen, you know, in decades. So that's a huge accomplishment. Um, you know, DEM for a number of years, our staffing had been kind of on the decline. At one point, if you go back um, to some point in the 90s, we were up somewhere over or around 600 employees. Um, and most recently, we were down below 400. So in this year's budget, we actually uh, received funding for nine new positions. And then they also uh, increased what's called the FTE cap, which is just the maximum number of employees that we can have at any given time, up to uh, an additional seven above that nine. So we're now up to 417. Um, and these are the people who do the work, right? You know, nothing gets done in government just because you pass a law. Um, that's obviously a big part of, of what has to happen. But at the end of the day, after the law is passed, somebody has to actually um, implement it and, and make it happen. And that's what we do here at DEM. So um, it's, been, uh, it's been great to see that the General Assembly has decided that, that DEM's mission, which of course includes um, some causes that are near and dear to the heart of, of the Food Policy Council, you know, whether it's farming or, or seafood or just food production in general, um, has decided that 
those are causes worth investing significant resources in. Um, so it's been a fantastic couple of years and I think we're all excited about what's to come in, in the next year. Thank you, Ryan. I, you know, I would just uh, venture to say that part of the this this better budget year is the net impact of all of the nonprofits and advocacy and lobbying groups that over the years have been trying to educate our legislators about natural resources and raise those issues. And it and I think the messaging is finally beginning to bear fruit. That in combination with the fact that the ARPA money came in. So we didn't have our normal sort of, you know, disaster, where do we cut, really showed what can happen. And I think that, you know, the long-term impacts of really effective advocacy and lobbying in terms of educating our legislators are, are very powerful. You may not see it in one particular session, but you see it over the long run, um, or at least that's the way we like to think about it. Uh, so all three of you talked about, um, we, we do have some questions in the chat and I do want to get to them. We have, we have some time, but I, you, all three of you talked about coalition building and, you know, coalition building is something that almost all of our council members are involved in, in their particular spheres. Um, could each one of you just address uh, sort of like tactically, what's your advice on how to do that well? Because it is complex. And I know that all of you have built coalitions among folks that don't agree on a lot of stuff. So it's not your friends and family, it's the ones that are not in your friends and family. And how do you do that? So um, again, just your thoughts on that quickly. Sorry, I'll start with Carrie. Sorry, I didn't know who was going first. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Coalition building is particularly difficult. Um, I think it had unique challenges when we were building the Nourish Rhode Island Coalition because it was right during the <clears throat> pandemic. And so we couldn't even meet in person. We couldn't go to the state house and do advocacy type days. Um, so for us, because um, we had that program planning year, we had a lot of the organizations already at the table, which was really nice. Um, and because we did the surveys and we did the focus groups, we also had SNAP recipients and we run our Food on the Move program. Um, so we had really good population access to the to the folks who would, would this would affect. Um, I think what made it challenging um, was uh, was COVID and not everybody has access to technology, right? And being sensitive to that, not everybody speaks English. Um, and so there are unique challenges there. Um, and so what I would say is just um, trying to meet people where they are. So we would go out in the field, outdoors at our markets and talk to people. Um, they were able to participate in an advocacy video. Um, we were able to have folks um, sign up online and, and submit a form to contact our legislators. Um, we were able to have an outdoor um, uh, press conference that folks were able to come speak at. Um, and then we offered patch through calling as well. So folks could, you know, we're, we're getting a call um, from an, from our agency that we had hired to say, you know, do you support this? Would you like us to contact, like put you through to, the, to your representative um, or your senator um, to tell them why you support this? So there's other ways to go about it. Um, but coalition building in general, like just make sure that you're meeting at like times when people agree, you're trying to make it as accessible as possible. Um, if you are able to meet in person, um, making sure that like it's not during like grassroots advocates working hours that it's, you know, after work and maybe there's a meal provided, there's childcare provided, just being like conscious of all of those things that could be barriers to people like it's on bus lines or there's plenty of parking you know things like that for your meetings um and just being consistent and and taking in people's opinions and using that to inform your messaging I think is really important um so those are kind of my little pieces of advice I've learned along the way <laughs> very helpful um Priscilla how about um how about the work that you do in coalition building those are great best practices shared by Carrie. So I'll touch upon some that are additive to that. Um, I think from, from my end and experience in working with coalitions, I think my first exposure was working um, with a coalition working to put a price on carbon. Um, and what I think about that was effective in that coalition building to when we were doing a multi-year effort to form a climate crisis campaign to get the act on climate across the finish line. 
um, and of course, from our work with the Environment Council um, in Climate Jobs Rhode Island, um, relationship building is really important. Um, you know, you can't expect to, um, out of the blue, um, you know, sometimes it could work that you just uh, meet someone and you're both thinking the same and you go from there, but really this, it's a time and effort, um, it's time and effort that you put into nurturing those relationships, building those relationships, and then ultimately being at a point where you can form partnerships. Um, and maybe a little frozen on Priscilla. I don't know if it's, um, not sure if it's your bandwidth, Priscilla. Oh. Am I back? You're back vocally, which is okay. the important part. I will keep your... my video off. It looks like my internet connection is unstable. Of course, it's That's been okay. fine all day yeah. till now. Um, and sorry, what last part did you hear? Um, you were talking about relationships and putting the time and effort into making those relationships strong enough. Yes. And then uh, like Harry said, meeting groups where they're at um, and taking the time to also listen, you know, to what are the needs of a community of an organization and really trying to figure out where is that common ground and also realizing that although there is common ground when it comes to coalition work and working with a diverse group of stakeholders focused on different areas and some areas that overlap, you will have to compromise. Um, you won't get everything that you're looking for um, out of the partnership or, or the effort, you know, in, in the first year, I think the, at least the goal, and actually this morning, we were just talking about this at a climate jobs, um, internal meeting where, you know, we've had successes in year one and year two of our coalition that are really going to help us accomplish more together going into year three. And that takes a lot of, um, a lot of communication between groups to know where groups stand, you know, what are their goals again, what are their needs and where are those points of interest. And also being very mindful of the areas that you don't agree on. And one of the things I think we've done really well um, with the groups I've been working for, we're mindful that if there's not unity around um, one initiative um, or a particular bill that we're not speaking for any group on their behalf. Um, that we're really making sure that we're mindful of, of who's representing who and when and where. Um, and I think that helps with trust, with the trust that's really needed um, in coalition building. And I will say the other part that has been useful for us is also developing, um, um, having points of contact in these coalitions, making it clear you know, who's doing what is really helpful to a group, especially when there are many individuals involved and making sure that we have the tools and the resources that groups need to be at the table and to be involved and to then, you know, be ambassadors of, of the coalition's work. That is super helpful. Uh, you know, as somebody who's watched your work, both organizations, uh, Public Health Institute and um, the environmental coalitions, it's really interesting how you have been able to build that trust and and make those compromises in a way that really work. And that is an art because people generally don't want to compromise on anything, nor should they. And then figuring out where they can compromise is really, really tricky. So um, I, you know, I think that's something that we all get better at as we do it. Um, but yeah, it's it's great to hear you both talk about that. Ryan, um, would love to hear your thoughts on on coalition building as well. Sure. So I, I, again, kind of go back to the, the idea that, you know, being at a state agency, um, I look at it, you know, I come at it from a little bit of a different perspective, um, you know, in the sense that working with stakeholders from outside of government is just so critical to, to everything that we do. Um, you know, it's, it's relatively easy for us as an administration or as an agency to have a bill introduced or to put a proposal forward. But when we go to the legislature, that alone is not typically going to be enough to, to get something passed. Um, it helps, but what's bigger is to be able to have folks like Priscilla, um, you know, who represent organizations that have thousands of members be able to come to the table and say, yes, this proposal makes sense, or yes, this is a good idea and we support it. Um, 
and and so just having those folks at the table, being able to speak to um, support of proposal is, is just hugely beneficial. Um, to give one example, I think folks maybe by now are kind of familiar that there's something called a green bond um, that goes on the ballot every couple of years, um, and basically that that's a proposal that goes to the voters to authorize borrowing money um, to fund a variety of environmental causes. And the specific components of the green bond varies from year to year based on what the needs are in that particular cycle um, and what the priorities might be of both the governor and the, the legislature um, as well as the stakeholders. Um, but just putting forward a, a bond proposal as an agency, um, there's a lot of proposals to borrow money that go out every year. I think what makes the difference with the green bond is that the environmental community, including all of the stakeholders in the various groups, are united behind it and kind of speak in one voice coming to the legislature saying, we want this to be on the ballot. This is important for the state's environment. Um, this is important for the future of Rhode Island. And that really gets people's attention. Um, when you have both the administration and the stakeholders coming and speaking in one voice, um, there, there's nothing in my opinion that's more powerful than that uh, from the perspective of the legislators. So. We have a, a coalition that has worked on the green bond now for a number of years that consists of, um, like I said, Audubon and, and Priscilla specifically, but also uh, there's about a dozen different groups that take part in that to varying degrees. Um, and it's become a little bit of a well-oiled machine where now, you know, we know every two years, all right, there's going to be a green bond put together and, you know, we're going to have to go to the legislature and first convince them to include it in the state budget and then you know, after that work is done, it's then how do we make sure that the voters approve it when it's on the ballot? Um, so just from the, the agency perspective, you know, we need our partners um, and folks at, in the advocacy community to be there, you know, hand in hand with us um, to make sure that we can get things done for the state. That's very helpful. So we have, a, we have a question from one of our council members, um, and I think it's primarily for Priscilla and, and Ryan. Um, Carrie, it may not be as important to you, but the question is, um, what are your thoughts about farmland conservation? Um, and I love the green bond machinery, and I love the fact that it is working so well, but as you both know, um, farmland conservation was not included this year, um, and it has been in many previous years. Uh, but the question is not about that little glitch. Uh, the question is more about your thoughts going forward about farmland conservation. So I'll turn it over to Priscilla first. And Priscilla, we can't see you, but we can we can still hear you. To be cautious, I'll keep my video off. Um, so when it comes to where Audubon is today and where I foresee our policy priorities being, I'll answer this from our standpoint. Um, I think through our history, we've been sure when, whether it comes through efforts through the green bond or other um, legislative um, or budget measures that there are resources um, for farmland um, preservation. Um, and I will, I will foresee that our organization will continue to be supportive of other groups that are more involved in farmland conservation, like the Rhode Island Land Trust Council, for example, um, and also working in partnership with DM and others in that space. Um, I think for us, um, the growing um, challenge is how do we ensure that our core forests are protected um, from any type of land use development, in particular solar, because that's where we're seeing the most acreage loss um, of uh, conservation land. Um, we do face a challenge in our state um, where about 68% of that core forest that's considered to be 250 acres in size or above in aggregate um, is privately owned, about 68%. Um, and that's, you know, something that I, I think as, as Audubon working with our conservation partners, um, and also working within the Forest Conservation Commission, um, which I am a part of now. Um, and that was through the Forest Conservation Act, um, sponsored by Rep Speakman, where we're looking at that particular challenge. You know, we, we know from a climate resiliency standpoint that our forests are very valuable. We also know that um, we, we face a challenge with climate 
with the climate crisis. So we will have to deploy more renewable energy, but it's about how these align. How do we better align our renewable energy programs with our climate goals and also not work, not really hindering our climate resiliency by clear cutting our most valuable core forests. Um, so within the Forest Conservation Commission, we're gonna be looking at how do we better support private landowners um, to preserve something that we consider so valuable like their core forests. Um, so I'll stop there. I think Ryan can um, also speak, speak to that as well. Thank you, Priscilla. Ryan, any thoughts on farmland preservation? Yeah, so so Diane, as you mentioned, there was a little bit of a hiccup um, with the green bond. Um, and, and I think really what happened was um, not to get too far into the details on this one, but you know, we had kind of included uh, farmland as part of a, a larger open space um, item in the bond. Um, and I think it was kind of belated that we realized that there was really a um, a larger need than, than what that number overall encompassed. Um, the good news is, you know, we remain completely committed to, to protecting farmland. Um, and we have in uh, recently in the budget proposal that DEM submitted to the administration included um, some funding that would hold us over for the next couple of years uh, until that next green bond um, comes into consideration, at which point, you know, we could look to to re up some funding there. So I, I think that um, I think Priscilla really um, hit the nail on the head um, in, in the sense that, you know, I, we all know Rhode Island is such a small state. And I think um, I think it's kind of starting to um, starting to become a real issue in the sense that we have so many competing uses for such a, a, a limited amount of land. I mean, obviously, we want to see the development of renewable resources, we want to protect our forests. Um, and the and, the habitat that they provide to wildlife. We want to conserve farms and ensure that, you know, that, that there's local food production, um, particularly given what we saw in terms of the supply chain disruptions during COVID. Um, I think that that really drove home the message that we need to be producing more of our food, um, not just here in Rhode Island, but, you know, regionally. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is we don't have a heck of a lot of lands to, to do all of those things. So, it's going to be a challenge, um, but I, I feel confident that that we will be able to find a, an appropriate balance between all of those uses. And um, I can just say that, you know, DEM remains committed to um, to ensuring that local food production continues to grow and that we um, preserve the farms that we do have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there is there is no doubt that in our small state, there is. Um, real serious competition for land use and um, and even within the farming community to really make farming um, you know a, a, me a method of climate mitigation we need more climate smart farming and soil regenerative farming and that's something that we also um, are well aware of at the food policy council so it's not just farmland it's also well well stewarded farmland um, but that is something that has been, um, as you saw from Nessa, a, a really high priority among council members and continues to be. We have some stuff going on in the chat about that as well. So good to hear your thoughts. Um, we're almost out of time. I'm gonna hand it back to Nessa for a second to just close us out, but thank you so much for all of your advice and generous with your time. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists again, and thank you, Diane and Steve for, for uh, really leading this meeting today. Um, and we are going to end on time. I put a few notes into the chat about how you can get involved and stay involved with the Rhode Island Food Policy Council. And thank you again for joining us for this Lunch and Learn. Thank you. Thank you.